Hello. Well, I have some very interesting information to bring to the table today. Uh, I believe that this information may be even of interest to people like Dr. Leonard Susskind here, which we'll get into here in just a second. But this is regarding theoretical physics. It's regarding black holes, and it's regarding how black holes store information. It's also uh, understanding of our universe and our reality. Uh, in the sense that it is a hologram. Uh, the information that I have to bring to the table uh, is, I think, part of possibly a smoking gun uh, based on the discoveries I've made. Now these guys right here, um, you know, I don't even want to try to compare myself to this person right here. Um, extremely brilliant. Uh, but um, I'm an analyst and what I do, for those of you who do not know me, uh, is I analyze the hell out of stuff. And uh, one of the things that I became interested in after a few series of discoveries, if you've been following me now for about well, about two or three years, uh, I'm a systems analyst, and I became interested in the mysteries um, that we see across culture found in various religious texts, Kabbalah, Hermetic literature, these various things. Uh, and I became interested in them because of a few discoveries that I made and as an analyst and after digging into what I found I knew that I was on to something that was pretty big. Well what I'm gonna do here is uh, we're gonna talk about black holes here in just a second. I'm gonna play a few clips from this guy but first what we're gonna do is for those of you who do not, do not know who I am and uh, and want to see kind of the stuff that I'm not going to do anything. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about any of the stuff that I have. I am going to touch on the important factors. I'm going to run through them rather quickly. So if you want to know more about my channel in detail, you can find uh, my videos in the overview playlist. I'll make it simple for you that way. That way I don't have to take up everybody else's time uh, talking in detail about any of the discoveries that I've made so far. But I am going to overview real quick. So uh, the discoveries that I made started sent finding the Orion Nebula in infrared in a church called Carl's Church, Carl's Church in 1737. And uh, this is an infrared version, so I knew I was onto something, plus the fact that there's no way they could have seen this in 1737. So I was dealing with something very mysterious. But at the same time, I was also noticing, and I found this in several cathedrals, that I was seeing that the Orion Nebula was always the main focus. Uh, and I kept seeing things just like this last image, where you see these angels circling around the center of the trapezium of the Orion Nebula. And in this instance, we have the Barnard's Loop circling the whole Orion constellation, where the center is the Orion Nebula again. So I began uh, to get the impression that I was dealing with some kind of a vortex, all intuitive. So if you recall back November 2011, November 28th, I began to make a series of videos because I dove deep into the trapezium looking for what I thought to be a black hole that may exist there. So one year later after that, they came out with news saying that there would be possibly a black hole in the Orion Nebula. And if it exists, the black hole would, be, would reside somewhere between the four bright stars which mark the center of the Orion Nebula as the trapezium. So right in this brightest area right here is where this black hole would be. So I called it one year before NASA but it was all based on cathedral art. I was finding cathedrals and I was finding these images, this information, if you will. I was finding this information and it was it was popping up a hundred years before the first telescope, such as Michelangelo's painting of the creation of Adam uh, and the two images that I just showed you. And not to mention um, probably about four or five more that are real easy to see. So I began to start digging into the mysteries and finding out what was going on here. I was uh, completely grabbed and I had to find out what was going on. So that's where it all began. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at some of the things 
that have been in these texts. We're going to listen to a couple of clips from my favorite, Manly Hall. Uh, and then after we listen to that, then we're going to dive into what I believe to be something that really puts the pieces together nicely for me, and I think it will also help these um, these physicists that are out there that are working on this stuff. Because one of the things that they haven't been able to do so far is see any kind of observable, uh, any anything observable that will support what they're talking about. And I think I may have this for them. So let's go through some of the stuff here real quick. Um, first of all, let's take a look at the, this is Hermes, this is the version of the world, and uh, I want you to listen to this right here. It says, Art thou not aware, O Asclepius, that Egypt is the image of heaven, or rather, that it is the projection below of the order of things above? And this is going to become really important here in just a little bit. Um, because we're going to see why this word projection really comes into play. So let's just get a little bit of an overview um, of what's going on here. Then I'm going to show you some of my stuff. And then I'm going to show you uh, Dr. Suskin's lecture. It's about 16 minutes because I've cut it down to about 16 minutes to get to the important parts that I want to show you. And then we're going to see why what he is describing fits right in to what I have been showing people for a long time now. But we're going to need to go through my stuff to kind of get a better understanding of what all that means. But first, for everybody who is not familiar with this, let's listen to what they have to say. For example, I seem real enough, don't I? Well, yes. But surprising new clues are emerging that everything, you and I and even space itself, may actually be a kind of hologram. That is, everything we see and experience, everything we call our familiar three-dimensional reality, may be a projection of information that's stored on a thin, distant, two-dimensional surface. Sort of the way the information for this hologram is stored on this thin piece of plastic. Now, holograms are something we're all familiar with, from the security symbol you find on most credit cards. But the universe is a hologram? That's one of the most drastic revisions to our picture of space and reality ever proposed. And the evidence for it comes from some of the strangest realms of space, black holes. This is a real disconnect that it's very hard to get your head around. Modern ideas coming from black holes tell us that reality is two-dimensional. That the three-dimensional world, the full-bodied three-dimensional world, is a kind of image of a hologram on the boundary of the region of space. This is a very strange thing. When I was a younger physicist, I would have thought any physicist who said that was absolutely crazy. Here's a way to think about this. Imagine I took my wallet and threw it into a black hole. What would happen? We used to think that since nothing, not even light, can escape the immense gravity of a black hole, my wallet would be lost forever. But it now seems that may not be the whole story. Recently, scientists exploring the math describing black holes made a curious discovery. Even as my wallet disappears into the black hole, a copy of all the information it contains seems to get smeared out and stored on the surface of the black hole in much the same way that information is stored in a computer. So, in the end, my wallet exists in two places. There's a three-dimensional version that's lost forever inside the black hole, and a two-dimensional version that remains on the surface as information. The information content of all the stuff that fell into that black hole can be expressed entirely in terms of just the outside of the black hole. The idea then is that you can capture what's going on inside the black hole by referring only to the outside. 
And in theory, I could use the information on the outside of the black hole to reconstruct my wallet. And here's the truly mind-blowing part. Space within a black hole plays by the same rules as space outside a black hole or anywhere else. So if an object inside a black hole can be described by information on the black hole surface, then it might be that everything in the universe, from galaxies and stars to you and me, even space itself, is just a projection of information stored on some distant two-dimensional surface that surrounds us. In other words, what we experience as reality may be something like a hologram. Is the three-dimensional world an illusion in the same sense that a hologram is an illusion? Perhaps. I think I'm inclined to think, yes, that the three-dimensional world is a kind of illusion and uh, that the ultimate precise reality is the two-dimensional reality at the surface of the universe. You and I, and everything around us, appear to exist in three dimensions. Up and down, front and back, left to right. But appearances can be deceptive. Many physicists now believe that reality is not, in fact, three-dimensional. Instead, they think that the fundamental core of reality comes written in two-dimensional sheets, like this piece of paper. In this view, our world is a three-dimensional projection of information that's written on a two-dimensional surface, an illusion much like a hologram. Clearly, this is insane. What are these sheets? Why would anyone think that reality is two-dimensional when everything we know appears in three dimensions? The answer lies in black holes. Black holes famously suck in everything around them and never let go. But what would happen if you were to throw something with a lot of information into a black hole? Something like a book or a hard drive. Physicists know that information can never be lost, only scrambled. So the information in our book can't disappear forever into the black hole, never to be recovered. It must still exist somewhere accessible to us. Physicists say it is written on the so-called event horizon of a black hole, the two-dimensional surface that defines a point of no return. Likewise, physicists have proven that events occurring on a two-dimensional sheet are interchangeable with the description in three dimensions. Mathematically, it's all the same, which leaves us to wonder, which is real? three dimensions we observe were the two-dimensional description that makes the math work. For Scientific American's Instant Egghead, I'm Michael Moyer. Okay, so back to the Orion Nebula again. So, what they described there was that <clears throat> that our reality that we see as 3D may actually be a hologram. But the way that they mention it is that our 3D reality is actually recorded or stored in 2D. So somewhere on a sheet, they, our reality is actually stored in that area. And where they say that it exists is actually on the horizon or the surface outside of a black hole. Now this is significant when we take a look at the Orion Nebula because I discovered what I believe to be a black hole in the Orion Nebula in the center of the trapezium a year before NASA. Then NASA comes out with that information. Now what you're going to see kind of unfold as I go through this stuff is you're going to see why when we take a look at the ancients, we take a look at the mysteries, we're going to see something being told here over and over. It's going to give us a very good clue to what is going on. Starting with Hermes here. Art thou not aware, O Asclepius, that Egypt is the image of heaven, or rather that it is the projection below? of the order of things above. So he's talking about a projection below. So that's really interesting. Also, if we take a look at the Mayans, the ancient Mayans, uh, we see that we have what's called the three hearthstones of creation. And they believe that the seat of creation is actually the Orion Nebula. These are the three hearthstones surrounding the Orion Nebula. Uh, Rigel, Olatek, and Sif. And the idea is, is that the act of seating the stones in the triangular pattern, according to the ancient Mayans, of the hearth created an image 
on the face of the earth and in the sky at the same time, which is where this would be. This is the surface area that sits outside of the black hole that we see right here. And they believed that this area, which is the Orion Nebula, was the seat of creation. So we have that same image now. We have the projection below of the order of things above, and then we have the Mayans saying that their face of the Orion Nebula was also on the Earth, or that we have a mirror going on here. In the secret teaching of all ages, with Manly Hall, we see that uh, when he's mentioning the Zohar, the Zohar is from the Jewish mysteries, the brow of God and his eyes formed a triangle in heaven, and its reflection formed a triangle in the waters. Well, this is the image that Michelangelo painted, and he painted a brain, most of us know that. But he also painted the Orion Nebula, and the interesting thing about it is, is it was 100 years before the first telescope. So, very interesting indeed, but from this we can extrapolate that he also painted a brain, and that bright triangular area that you see right there is located where the brow is, which is called the pineal gland. And that's what we see and when we read this, that the brow of God and his eyes formed a triangle in heaven and his reflection formed a triangle in the waters. What is the waters that it's speaking of? It's speaking of the mirror, which is earth. Well, let's listen to a couple of uh, Manly Hall clips here. And we'll get an idea of what's actually going on here. Around whose body the stars and planets moved, and whose face was always in profile, because deity was represented always with one eye. This mysterious macroprosomus was the clothed God, clothed in creation. God as creation, as made up of a great cluster of stars, and it was surrounded by angels full of eyes, which were the stars, and its vehicle was the Merkava of Ezekiel, the chariot of righteousness. This macroprosophus, or the long face, rises above the horizon of infinites, like a sun rising from darkness. And because this horizon of infinites resembles more than anything else a great ocean, it is represented as a mirror. And as the face rises above, the reflection of the face inverted appears in the ocean beneath. And therefore we have the two great faces, one looking down, one looking up from the shadows below. So again, we have another mention of this mirror. And we have a mention of it being the shadows below, just like the projection below of the order of things above. This is the face that he's talking about. For those of you who are not into the whole religion thing, I completely understand. When I first started this whole process, uh, the whole process was not to become involved religiously in any manner, but it was to understand our reality better. And when you go through these ancient mysteries and these various cultures, uh, if you understand and can interpret their lingo correctly, you find that they're all talking about the same thing. So we hear about this from the Jewish mysticism, we hear about it from ancient Egypt, we hear about it from Hermes, we hear about it everywhere. And we speak um, of Hermes, speaks of as above, so below, and he also speaks of a particular pattern. This might be interesting to the, uh, the physicists as well, because this particular pattern which uh, Dr. Susskind mentions in his lecture. Uh, he, he says basically that you can't really decode the information on the outside of it because you would have to know the code. Well, the code or the pattern actually, in our circumstance, actually happens to be man. Man is the pattern. And as you can see right here, it is the image or the archetype of a brain. But this takes us all the way back into philosophers like Plato, uh, the world of forms and ideas as well. Let's listen to what we have here about with Hermes real quick and then we're going to hop back over and we're going to listen to the lecture by uh, 
Dr. Susskind, and then we'll wrap it all up and uh, kind of see what we've got going on here. And I'll show you uh, the mirror that we have going on between the two areas. Now this matter, if we are to believe Hermes, the great uh, Egyptian uh, mystic, the thermaturgist, of whom, whose life nothing is known. But anyway, in his emerald tablet, Hermes declares that the above is like the, like the below, the superior is like the inferior, the lesser is like the greater, the greater is like the lesser. All things follow one immense pattern. And if anyone can break the mystery of that pattern in any one point, any one level, he has the key to the whole mystery. So the pattern that's actually being spoken of is man. And we see this particular pattern here, and we also see it on the planet Earth as well. The Egyptians, uh, where they placed the pyramids, as we will see here in just a little bit, they did this in order to show us the mirror between this area and what we see uh, below as well. There's also one more place that we can find inside the Zohar that mentions the mirror. And this is something that the uh, physicists may be interested in as well because the idea that we always have this the black holes eating everything um, in this particular case and what we seem to see all over the ancient mysteries is that they always speak of a pillar, they always speak of a black hole, the description of a black hole, but they also always talk about that this black hole creates stars. We always hear this. We hear it in the Bible, we hear it in the Zohar here, we hear it in the vision of Hermes, we hear it in all of these things. But the interesting thing about it is, is what these stars are actually doing apparently. See it says he made the stars also and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, that is, upon his lower world, which is a replica or reflection of the world above. So now we have this same projection below, where in this case, it seems that the stars themselves are being used to project the light, just like you would shine a light uh, through a hologram in order to create or the, uh, the information in order to create the hologram. So, very interesting indeed. So we can see this mirror occurs over and over through all, all these various cultures. And they're always pointing to the Orion Nebula. And this is the reason why we see it in Egypt and mysteriously in all of these cathedrals and described with the profile of this person facing to the right. It's all across the cultures. So now, let's listen to a little bit more of the lectures, and then we'll come back and tie it up with the mirror and show um, anyone who's interested in, and I believe that it would be very beneficial to uh, people like Dr. Suskin to see this type of information. I think it would be very helpful for them so that uh, we could possibly um, find out a little bit more about our reality. So let's listen to what they have to say. Let's... Forget your slides, Raphael, for the moment, if you don't mind. And go to Leonard's slide, which really gets us from this idea of there's a bunch of information and it maps into something that we might think of as a three-dimensional image. Victoria, can you put uh, Leonard's first slide up? Okay, what is this? This one? Uh, that's a microscopic picture of the film of a hologram, which in fact... I made up myself with a Microsoft Paint, so it's a fake. But it's about what it would look like. It's about what, if you look through the microscope at the film, not the thing that is being described by the hologram, but by the piece of film itself, it would look approximately like that. And uh, so then if you put light no, through it in some it, particular way... Right, well, let's, let's first... It's got some information in it. It's all yep. scrambled. It's impossibly yep. scrambled. You can't look at this and see what the, what it is. Anybody, any guesses what the, yeah. the image guesses? is there? Anybody want to guess? What? Leonard Susskind? Uh, uh, exactly. Good. Donald Trump. Guess down here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. So it is, it is a fake. Uh, uh, anyone say puppy? Anyone say puppy? Little horsey? Uh, no, no horsies. Okay. All right. Let's see. Well, okay, go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. Here's, here's the standby, folks. All right. 
this. This is another fake. I also drew that myself. All right. All right. So if you do the right thing with the hologram, namely shine light on it and so forth, it'll reconstruct an image. So the the, the you got the flashlight. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe this is obvious, but right. the flashlight going right. through the film, but, and somehow the the yeah. information it, it, uh, t in the film recreates the 3D yeah. image of the clown smoking the cigar. But that's the, right. But the interesting thing about it is that the clown is three-dimensional. You can go behind it and you can see whether he has hair on the back of his head. You can go underneath and look at the chin underneath. In fact, if this hologram had been made not with ordinary light, but if it had been made by uh, an NMR scan, you could have coded on that boundary, on that uh, surface, you could have the interior, you could have all your guts and blood and everything else, bones. The entire full three-dimensional structure would have been mapped. You used the word map, and it's a good word. Mapped onto the boundary, onto the film. Uh, and the important thing is not that you shine light to reconstruct it, but that the information about the clown is equally well, and in fact, in some sense, better described, more accurately described, more precisely described by the uh, little dots and dashes and uh, structures that are entirely scrambled, totally impossible for you to just look at, but it's there. It's there in that film. It's there. And... and yeah. We then introduce our speaker. Uh, our speaker is the author of a best-selling book about black holes called The Black Hole War, and it's the topic we've asked him to address tonight. Dr. Le Leonard Suskind is the Felix Bloch Professor of Theoretical Physics at Stanford University, and the author not only of The Black Hole War, but also The Cosmic Landscape, another introduction to the far-out frontiers of physics and astronomy. He's written many articles on recent developments in science and their meaning. He teaches a popular continuing studies course at Stanford on modern physics and has won the American Institute of Physics Science Writing Prize for an article explaining black holes in everyday language. His scientific research focuses on particle physics, quantum theory, and the nature of gravity. Small questions, right? But in fact, he is as well known for being a superb explainer of science. And so we have asked him tonight to explain a little bit about his ongoing intellectual battle with Stephen Hawking on the subject of some of the most mysterious objects in the universe, black holes. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a professional privilege for me to introduce Dr. Leonard Susskind. ultimate upshot of this confusion that was raised by Hawking in the first place, but it's a big deal. It's not a small deal. It meant we were thinking completely wrong about information, how it was stored, where it is found, how relative it is, and how objective a piece of information is. The whole subject got turned on its head. Now, an even more startling conclusion that came out of this series of investigations, the world is like the ghostly three-dimensional illusion cast by a hologram. That sounds very weird. Most of you know what a hologram is, but before I get to holograms, let me explain something about information and how it's stored ordinarily. This is supposed to be a picture of a library. In fact, it was supposed to be the picture of the library in Alexandria. It's my artist's rendition of it. It was known to be about, I think, 200 feet by 40 feet by some number of feet in this direction here. Question? I thought I heard a question. This is the library. This is the library in Alexandria, reconstructed according to my own imagination. And it had a certain size. We could ask how much information could be stored in that library. Well, it turned out that about a trillion bits of information were stored in the library in Alexandria in the form of scrolls. A trillion bits of information. In other words, information could be turned into a, a billion dots and dashes. A billion is not very much. Why couldn't you store more information? Well, you certainly could. You could shrink it down from scrolls to books or from books to microfiche, or you could squeeze it down onto, um, uh, you know, digital uh, 
tips and get a lot more information in there. But what's the maximum amount of information that you could put into a library this big? And the answer most physicists always thought was that there was a limit. You could not make a bit of information smaller than one cubic Planck length. If that's the case, you can calculate the number, the volume of this library in Planck units, and you would discover that it was about 10 to the 108th. That's a huge number. That's more than all the particles in the known universe. That it could hold 10 to the 108th bits of information. A huge amount could be stored in there. Well, what if the owner of this library passed a law, a crazy law, the crazy law is that you're not allowed to put any information in the interior of the library. All you're allowed to do is decorate the outside of the laboratory with writing, with information. Arbitrarily small. You can make your letters no bigger than the Planck scale, but then how much information can the library store if it's only allowed to have its bits of information coating the surface of the library? A lot less. It's proportional to the area of the surface of the uh, library. Only 10 to the 72. Well, that doesn't sound like a big difference, 10 to the 72 and 10 to the 108. But if you're familiar with thinking about numbers, 10 to the 108 is vastly, vastly bigger than 10 to the 72. And so you lose a lot of possibility of storing information if you can only put it on the outside. Well, it's a strange law of nature. And it is now believed by everybody who works in theoretical physics to be a law of nature that you can never put more information into a library or into a volume of space than the amount that you can store on the boundary. It is as if all that you could never have more information in this room than the amount that you could store on the boundaries of this room if you reduced it down to little pixels, pixels on the boundary of the room, and that seems extremely counterintuitive, extremely so. Uh, to illustrate the difference between information being stored in volume and being stored on surface area, I just invite you to look at this picture here. This picture has a great, uh, this is um, uh, Rembrandt's uh, uh, anatomy lesson. And it sure looks three-dimensional. It looks like there's all kinds of three-dimensional information here. The dead man here looks uh, foreshortened. He looks uh, more or less as if you're looking at him from, uh, from the feet on because he's so short. There's information behind this guy's head here in a scroll. Everything looks very three-dimensional, but of course it's an illusion. There is no three-dimensional information here. You cannot tell whether this dead man is foreshortened or whether he's just short. You cannot walk around the picture and see what's on the scroll behind the, behind the tall man's head here. In fact, you can't even tell whether this is a real three-dimensional object or whether it's just a flat painting of a three-dimensional object. It doesn't really have three-dimensional information. The three-dimensionality of it is an illusion. It's in your head. Information is being stored, since this was actually a photograph taken with a digital camera, that information is stored in pixels, two-dimensional array of pixels. Obviously, that two-dimensional array of pixels cannot really store three-dimensional information. It's an illusion. Can you store three-dimensional information? Sure. You can store it by storing it three-dimensionally. Instead of pixels, you store it in the form of voxels. Voxels mean three-dimensional arrays of dots and dashes. In other words, a three-dimensional tic-tac-toe puzzle. If you allowed yourself to store information, bits of information, on a three-dimensional lattice like this, of course you could store all the information in a three-dimensional picture. But obviously, you can't store three-dimensional information on two-dimensional pixels. Well. That's not actually true. Holograms are examples of the storage of three-dimensional information on a two-dimensional film. A, two, a hologram is a two-dimensional film. This is a picture of the film on which a three-dimensional 
figure is depicted by the method of holograms. What do you see? You see a scramble of meaningless scratches and dots and dashes. Impossible to decipher what this is a picture of. Completely scrambled. But it is two-dimensional. However, if you know the rules, and in this case the rule is simple, you just shine light on the hologram, it will create a three-dimensional image, and it's not like Rembrandt's painting of the anatomy lesson. You can, if I was any good at making um, uh, uh, videos, I would have you turn this thing around and look at the clown from the back. But a hologram is a picture like this, stored on a two-dimensional film, that allows you to reconstruct a full three-dimensional image that you can walk around, look at it from the back, look at it from the front, and in principle, you could even make a hologram of the interior of his head, his brain, and see every bit of information that's going on inside the clown's head, but stored on the two-dimensional hologram. So it's not really true that you cannot store three-dimensional images in two dimensions. Well, one of the things we found out, and I'm going to explain to you how we found it out, was that in a certain mathematical sense, the entire universe, the entire world, can be thought of as a hologram out on the boundaries of space at the very edges of the universe, 10 billion light years away, a kind of two-dimensional holographic image. Now, one of the things that he mentions here that I would, I would add to this is that where he mentions this being <clears throat> 10 billion light years away, I think of it as uh, also being uh, something that can happen in smaller areas as well, which is what we're going to be seeing with the Orion Nebula. So it's very possible we have a larger one, but then within that we have smaller black holes that are performing the same functions that he's describing here. Encodes, encodes all of the information that's there filling up the universe in the form of stars, planets, people, and everything else. This is one of the weirdest and most unintuitive extrapolations in physics since quantum mechanics. It is truly weird, but it has taken over physics and it has become a principle of physics. It's called the holographic principle. I'm going to show you how we came to that. We came to that by thinking about black holes. So, how did we ever come to such an unintuitive thing? Let's start with a box. I have made a round box, a round spherical box, because it's easy uh, to think about a round sphere. A box is just a thing that could contain something. It's not even necessary that the walls of the box are real, just a region of space. And let's put some information into that box. That information could be in the form of matter. Here it's cheese and wine. It could be in the form of a bunch of a gas of elementary particles. It could be vapor. It could be anything. It could just be dots and dashes on a page in a book that you could throw in here. Let's put some information in there inside a certain volume, and that volume is bounded by a certain area. Now let's take that information. This is, a good, this is the kind of experiments when you can't do real experiments, you do thought experiments. Here is the thought experiment. One would love to be able to do this, but it's quite impossible technologically. Let's surround that stuff by a shell of material. It could be steel, or it could just be light coming in. A shell of material that's been accelerated inward so that it's about to collapse. Let's make that shell of material just massive enough so that when it gets to the boundary over here, it creates a black hole. Everybody who thinks about black holes will admit that this is a possibility, that you can add to a system an amount of material, squeeze it down until what's left over is a black hole. Well, if no information is lost during this process, 
And remember, it's a basic law of physics that information can never really be lost. If no information is lost, then the, in, the initial information in there, in the wine, the cheese, and the particles, must be less than the amount of information in the black hole. But we know how much information is in the black hole. It's proportional to the surface area. That's what Bekenstein taught us. One bit of information for each square Planck area on the black hole. What does that tell us? That tells us that there could never have been more information in this region than what can be stored on the surface. You cannot store more information in a region than what can be on the surface in the form of one bit per Planck area. Why? Because you can always shrink it down into a black hole and then the amount of information is known and if none can be lost, then there must have been less information to begin with. If there's less information, or at least no more information, than can be stored on the surface, that's as good as saying that everything that was in there can be represented by information on the boundary of the black hole. Another way to say it is the boundary of the black hole, the horizon, is a hologram. It is, in fact, a hologram. So he's saying that the horizon of the black hole is a hologram. So that area that surrounds the black hole is an actual 2D hologram. And this is going to be really important, and I think it really puts a huge piece of the puzzle together with what we're going to see here in just a bit. There are two reconstructions of the hologram. One reconstruction Alice sees when she jumps into it. When she jumps into it, she sees the images that are reconstructed from the hologram. Planets, stars, even her own head and her arms when she gets inside the black hole. But on the other hand, Bob watching from the outside sees the boundary of the black hole as a collection of bits, in other words, like a holographic film. So, this guy right here sees what we would see if we were looking at the Orion Nebula. It's one big holographic film. It is one large hologram storing all of the data that will fit inside of the black hole, but it's actually stored on the outside of the black hole. So everything on the inside is actually shown on the outside in this area that surrounds it as one large 2D hologram representing many different things. If you're inside the hologram you see everything 3D like we do. If you're on the outside of the hologram like he is then you see the hologram film itself. However, if the inside of the hologram is also showing the Orion Nebula inside the hologram. And that means if you're inside the hologram, you would also see the image that he sees right here as well, almost as a, a kind of a loop in a way. It's really interesting. We're going to see how this plays in just a second. That holographic film eventually evaporates. Just like any real film, a real film that's left out in the, in the warm air will eventually evaporate, and that's the Hawking evaporation process. So, we have a very, very surprising conclusion. It's called the holographic principle. The world, what did I write? The world is pixelated, not voxelated. In other words, this entire room, everything in it, is really represented mathematically by a theory on the boundary which is very much like a hologram. Uh, that idea, that idea has now become a central pillar of physics. It is not any longer a conjecture, it is now a mathematical reality that the universe, the entire universe, can be represented as a boundary theory with everything on the boundary, where the boundary is out near the horizon the horizon of the universe. Well, this is something that, of course, has never and, and probably will never be directly experimentally tested. And that, I believe, is going to be changed here pretty soon. 
if we can get people like him to take a look at the information that I have for him. So he goes on to explain that uh, that Hawking wrote him a letter because <laughs> Hawking lost the bet. And this is a really interesting theory because uh, what I think is makes it very strong and the reason why I listen to it is because in my uh, analysis across culture into the ancient cultures uh, in almost every one of them we hear about a black hole Osiris Ta which was the potter that formed everything from a potter's wheel the same thing in the vision of Hermes we hear about we hear about the same thing in the Bible with the pillars the pillars of fire uh, we hear the uh, the same thing with the Mayans, the smoke that comes out of the hearth. We hear this all over the place, and it's always pointing to the Orion Nebula, which is a black hole. Well, in my own discoveries, before even knowing about this particular uh, theory, uh, I had discovered in, in these cathedrals, as I've shown you, that there were these very interesting images. Now, we, he calls this information. The question is, is what is information? Um, information seems to be anything, including thought, uh, including uh, images, including everything. And how is that stored? Well, from my experience, what I have noticed is in these famous paintings that uh, you can find the same lines within the nebula in these particular paintings just like we see right here in these paintings just like we see on like the conversion of Saul with Michelangelo or Michelangelo's creation of Adam we'll just show you that one real quick so these images that you can see are repeated all the way through, but yet this is the Orion Nebula. But yet we can see that not only are those images what he painted there, but also the image of a brain. And if we zoom in closer, we can clearly see that from image recognition, these same patterns are stored inside the same nebula. So what I liken this to is based on all of the images and all of the paintings that I've found uh, and even geography which we're going to take a look at now see this is the mirror that exists between the Orion Nebula this was the triangle that we heard talked about in the heavens the brow of God and his eyes formed a triangle in heaven its reflection formed a triangle in the waters and we see that this mirror exists even at larger levels and even all the way to the whole world just like the Mayans mentioned as well it's the projection below of the order of things above and when we take a look at the above the above is the black hole and what sits outside of the black hole is that 2d representation of the 3d hologram that we exist inside and that's the reason why we see Jordan here, this dark area, and these patterns copied. But the reason they're not exact patterns is because we have tons of information inside of this large hologram, which is the Orion Nebula. And they're overlaid on top of each other. I almost liken it to taking a bunch of uh, transparent photos, um, or semi-transparent, like slides, for example, that you would put in a projector taking a bunch of semi-transparent slides and stacking them on top of each other to where you can see all of the various slides but unless you know the code that you're looking for you won't be able to recognize anything it'll all look garbled but what's actually happening is, is all of the images are being laid on top of each other so these are the images that we can see between the Nile Delta which is the center of the world and by the way let me just show you the uh, full planet version of this which the Mayans also talk about as well and I discovered all this before I had read the text and the mysteries and now when I hear him talk about this it's even more confirming so the very center of this circle sits right where the Great Pyramids are this is the mirror they were trying to show us and so that green little area that you see right here which is the Nile Delta 
if we use sacred geometry we can put that center of the circle right there the center of the circle here sits just at the base of the trapezium now this is the center of all Earth's land masses right here and we can also see that the waterways between the two land masses we can see that there is a kind of a mirror that exists there we can also see that this center covers this whole area of the cloud right here and this is the image that was put on the face and in the sky that the Mayans are talking about and even interestingly what is being told to us by theoretical physics is that this area just outside the black hole is a 2D representation. It is the um, 2D representation of the 3D hologram that we live in. And that is a huge key to the puzzle here. Let's take a look at another one real quick. And what I've explained to people before, when you notice the patterns of these things, it all becomes very clear where the center is. And it makes perfect sense why the pyramids were placed exactly where they were. They were trying to show us this mirror. The pyramids were also called the Tomb of Hermes, and in there was actually found uh, the representation of what they called universal mind, which might be an, another way of representing in physics what they would call this information storage area whatever they want, what would want to call it. I'm not really sure what they would call that. But here you can see that the overall pattern of the Nile Delta, the overall green area, is the same as the overall yellow area that we see here. And these rectangles right here show patterns that are found inside this that repeat all the way through. The difference is, is we kind of have a nebulous version right here, but we have a more crystallized and objective version right here. But we can see that these patterns exist all the way through. Now what also might interest these physicists is that this particular patterns that you see right here are man-made structures. In other words, they are not natural. They are uh, land formations and grid structures that have been recently um, made by man. So this is not the leaf matching the tree. So this kind of also helps to explain the whole hologram idea because we can see that they're repeated all the way through uh, to the Orion Nebula in each one of these areas that we see right here. So when we take a look at the Orion Nebula, we're actually looking at that 2D version, that hologram that contains all of that information all piled on top of each other. It contains all of the information. And we see in the mysteries that stars which were actually created by this area also and if you take a look at the whole Orion constellation you can see that the whole Barnard's loop centers into the Orion Nebula with the stars that are popping out of it all the way back to the Orion Nebula so I believe it's older than what they think but it creates the stars but if you remember in the mysteries it says it creates the stars in order to give the light to the earth below the replica like we read here. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, that is, upon the lower world, which is a replica or reflection of the world above it. So we see this constant mention of the hologram. We can clearly see that the hologram exists here. We can see the mirror that exists here. And we have Hermes mentioning that it is the projection below of the order of things above, the code that is above that is all written inside here. So we have this area right here that represents our world and who knows what else. The pattern that exists and the code that exists in this uh, is actually man himself, which is one of the reasons why the ancient Egyptians used the Nile as a spinal cord. They were trying to show us that it is a representation of man, but also a representation of what they called universal mind. So anyways, I thought that would be interesting to, uh, for everybody to see that this information even is confirmed when we take a look at theoretical physics regarding black holes, and it just so happens that this area is exactly uh, what they're describing, and everyone knows that for the longest time I have said that this area looks like a huge hologram. And I've shown everybody this mirror that exists for the longest time and I think this right here 
will be very beneficial to people like Dr. Suskin. So you guys take care. I'll talk to you soon.